How's it going my friends? So this video is a little bit different. I want to do something special for the 100,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, I've mentioned in the last video that I might talk about a few of my favorite tools. And so I thought, uh, why not just uh, go through all of my tools? <laughs> well, I'm not going to go through all of them, but, but yeah, I'm just going to make a really long video talking about lots of stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to timestamp in the description uh, when I'm talking about what. So for instance, if you want to hear about chisels, uh, you can just skip the video and go and you can go straight to that. So yeah, before we start, I just want to mention that I'm not affiliated with any of the companies or brands or sites that I'm going to talk about. I know that Amazon has this uh, kind of commission thingamajig. Uh, I don't know how to do it and I don't think that's the point of this video. So uh, yeah, let's jump in and uh, start talking. <laughs> All right, let's start talking about my uh, hand planes that this is kind of my collection. I have a few more other wooden planes in my uh, closet that I've used in the beginning, but later on I replaced them with some metal planes. So I thought I didn't need to show them up and talk about them. But I will just go through what I think is a, a good plane to start with and uh, what kind of planes I made or bought and used to for you know for other things. So let's start with my uh, kind of uh, work horses, my two metal planes. Let's start with this one. This is a silver line. Uh, my friend bought it for me and it's from the UK and it's a very it's a cheap plane. It's one of those really cheap companies that sell a whole bunch of tools for no amount of money. But this surprisingly is incredible how they managed to make all this quality for like a 35 dollars, forty dollars maybe. Uh, the cheapness does creep in to some places like really you know the small refinement, the inconsistency in the manufacturing meaning that sometimes these planes can be a little bit banana shaped. Mine was too and I had to flatten it and uh, some you know the edges are kind of sharp and all this kind of but yeah a plane for a budget this is I can only recommend this for the price uh, even the handles are kind of, they say it's rosewood and I kind of tend to believe them. Even my Stanley one I don't think is rosewood. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Really high quality for the price. But at some point I decide I will upgrade uh, to a Stanley plane. It's an old plane from, I don't know, I think it's the 60s because of the writings here. And uh, it is, it is, you can feel that is you know, slightly better than this one. You know, when it comes to planes and tools in general, the more and the more expensive they get, the smaller the amount of quality they gain. But uh, it's still, you know, when it comes to a lot of parts, it still comes together. And at the end of the day, the Stanley is definitely better than the silver silver line. It's slightly lighter. It's a little bit more, you know, just overall slightly better manufactured. So what I've done is that this is my uh, go-to smoothing plane and what I've done with this one is that I made it a scrap plane and it's absolutely a monster at hogging of material. Yeah, I would recommend getting it just for that. Now let's talk about my, uh, let's call it the more specialized planes. Most of the ones, well the ones I've here are, I've made myself and uh, they're kind of blocky more in a Japanese fashion and I really like the aesthetics of it. But let's talk a, a little bit about my other specialty planes, we'll call them. So this is like a, a I think a rebate plane, shoulder plane maybe. A simple German one, nothing too fancy. Uh, you can get those I think everywhere. Uh, this one is also made. Spoke shapes, uh, this I actually also made but the mouth, is, the mouth gap is a little bit too narrow and the sole is a bit wide. So I'm probably gonna work on that. This one is a bit more of my go-to spoke shave. However, this type of mechanism with the screw in the middle doesn't work. It doesn't, weirdly enough, it doesn't hold the blade secure and the blade kind of goes backwards all the time. So as it goes for spoke shaves, I'm still not very happy. I want to buy someone that is a little bit more reliable and that doesn't move around too much. Uh, block planes, I have this one and this one I've made. These essentially do the same thing. Well, in my uh, work, that is. Maybe it's a Stanley. I don't know. Uh, works really nicely. Very simple. 
nice block plane for I used for end grain and uh, to get rid of the irises and things like that. Uh, this I like much better because it's much fun to hold and uh, and uh, what happened was is that a few videos ago I made this double sided plane right here and I like the blade so much that I decided to make a dedicated block for it and this works amazingly well so I'm really happy I have that. These are kind of the projects that when I take a break from YouTube I uh, like to make a small tool so you know I can relax and do something for myself so usually that's what I do. Uh, this is kind of a router plane these two and they are uh, really delightful. They are very simple. Uh, Paul Sellers shows how to make a poor man's router. This is the same idea. Yeah, basically I make all sorts of small planes that are very dedicated for a specific job and uh, they're relatively simple to make and they, they work really nicely. So I would recommend doing that. All right, moving on to saws. Saws is kind of something that I'm still struggling with and maybe it's because I didn't uh, do the right thing and just invest in a nice good one that I want it might cost a little bit more money but I think I would have saved some of it uh, early on if I uh, knew what I'm doing so what I mean by that this saw right here even though it looks relatively nice the handle I've made myself it used to have a plastic blue handle but this is a really cheap saw from uh, kind of like a home center type of um, shop and I've seen in all of the saws that they sell there is that they give this kind of a teeth tooth geometry that fits both cross cut and rip cut and if you ask me they fit neither of those <laughs> and they also harden the teeth so you cannot f file them ever unless you have diamonds fi diamond files but I don't recommend buying these saws unless you're just doing a home improvement type of project and you don't want to invest in a more expensive saw. So usually my go-to with saws is buying an antique one, antique, an old one and restoring it. I really like this saw right here, but weirdly enough it has a very, very aggressive uh, teeth on it relative to the size. Uh, I think it's like 8 or 10 TPI and I really wish it had like 14 or 16. So when it comes to a hand saw, I think I still don't have the one that I really, really want. Uh, and this is something that I will talk about really soon, what I intend to do. This one looks pretty fancy, but it actually uh, is relatively cheap and I don't like it so much because it skiddles, skips. Uh, so I don't know what to say about that exactly. And this kind of a, is a Frankenstein. I took the blade from some other saw and I put a different handle and it works but it feels like uh, you cannot trust it very much. Uh, this, you probably, many of you know, uh, Japanese saws are absolutely incredible, but my issue with Japanese saws is that I don't like the idea that you replace blades all the time. It's not all the time, they do last pretty long, but just the, the fact that I cannot file it myself, that it's not my kind of blade that I work with it and reuse it and refile it is something that I really want to do but for a really really fine uh, saw like this one that's kind of worth it because this saw cuts uh, incredibly well. All in all up until now I feel like I enjoyed uh, Japanese saws more uh, just because they have a little bit more finesse to them but you know it's a uh, you know it's very broadly speaking and I feel like I'm a little bit more patient. I enjoy the cut a little bit more. And, uh, and that's the thing. If I don't enjoy sewing, then I, I try to avoid it. So, so probably what I'm going to do next is maybe invest in a slightly higher tier, uh, what's it called, the double-sided Japanese saw, that the cross cut and rib cut, uh, and one that doesn't have hardened teeth. So uh, it retains the edge a little bit uh, less or whatever, but... Uh, I will be able to resharpen it and I think that would be my uh, favorite way to go. So yeah, that's about basically about my saws and nothing too much to them, but uh, let's move on. So sharpening, that's a big topic and uh, there's lots and lots to talk about and lots and lots of people already did. So I will just tell you 
what works for me and what I like and uh, and I think I will try to give a different take on sharpening and uh, what I think is important. First, let's get rid of the stones that are not interesting. For instance, uh, this one is a Belgium very hard stone. I don't like this one. That's a special, uh, you know, carving chisel, gouges stone. Some small weird shapes that you buy flea markets. That's a small stone that I use for my gravers. This uh, is a high grit stone. They're very little bit broken from shipping. Uh, but they're like 3,000, 8,000, uh, I think. They're very, very hard stones. So I use them for my gravers mostly. And these are very, very cheap. They're from Hong Kong or something like that. And uh, yeah, they work nicely. I use them a lot. So if you've been on a lookout for a budget sharpening stones, especially on Amazon, you'll probably have seen this one. Uh, this is very dirty, so it used to be blue and white. And this is 1000 grit and 6000. Now I have to admit, in the beginning that I started using it, uh, before that I had some cheap diamond, diamond stones. And when I got these, I was very happy in the beginning because they, they are really nice to use and they remove material pretty nicely. So the 1000 stone is actually pretty decent and it's pretty hard as well. Now the 6000 stone is where I would complain a little bit. Now I don't, I'm not an expert, but the 6000 grit stone is definitely not a 6000. Now I know that when it comes to Japanese grits and especially with water stones, the grits can vary, the numbering can vary. And I think this one is around 2000. Which is also fine, we can get away with 2000 very, very nicely. However, this stone is super soft. It's almost as soft as a, the Nagura stone. And so it wears out super quickly. I didn't use it, well, I used it quite a bit, but I didn't expect it to have a belly that quick. So it's a very nice stone, but I'm a bit reluctant to recommend it just yet because I have another stone here that I would really, really recommend. Uh, to get instead of this one. So let's move on. So these two are uh, kind of my roughing stone, let's call it. Uh, this is not very aggressive. It's 1000 diamond stone. It's a very relatively cheap one. So I cannot say too much about diamond stones because I never owned a high quality one. But what I would say from my experience with diamond stones is that I don't like the feeling of working with them. So I don't enjoy the process of working with them because it's kind of a, I don't know how to explain it, but you put a, a metal on metal a contact and uh, it just doesn't feel nice. I don't feel like I have as much control when it, as opposed to stone. Uh, this is a India stone, uh, which means you use oil on it. And again, it's kind of in between diamond stone and a water stone, it's very robust as opposed to water stone. It doesn't wear out very quickly, but the feeling you have from it is kind of a meh feeling. It's, I don't know, I don't want to offend anybody, but it feels like you're hurting the chisel a little bit, you know what I mean? Uh, but it does work and I actually do enjoy using it, so I don't complain with this too much. Now, let's move on to the water stone that I would definitely, definitely recommend. Now, this cost maybe twice as much as this one. This is the smaller, smaller ones, but, uh, but the quality is really, really evident. The 1000, even though the 1000 stone on both of these is relatively decent, this one feels like it packs a little bit more punch. And it's, uh, this one is almost feels like oil stone. And this one is nice and smooth and gives a really nice feeling when you work with it. And on the other side, you have the 6000. Now, uh, as opposed to this one, both of these claim to be 6000, or at least it's written to be 6000. And this one, I actually believe that it is because from this one, I get a mirror polish or almost a mirror polish. And it's a much, much harder stone than this one, than the, and so it lasts a lot longer, it's much more robust, and it gives an, a, an absolutely amazing edge that you, in many cases, don't even need to strop if you don't want to, but if you want, like, I don't know, a razor-sharp thingamajig, 
you can go to the leather and strop it. So this one is uh, from King. I'm sure that a lot of you know about King. But when it comes down to, for me, this is the first stone I actually was looking forward to sharpening. This is a stone where uh, my sharpening became more ceremonial, more consistent, and just in general, a much more pleasurable experience. And that's why I love this stone so much, as opposed to all the rest. Uh, so yeah, I will definitely recommend it. Again, not affiliated. I just want to tell you what uh, works for me and maybe it will work for you too. So one thing I want to say about files that I think really applies to them more than any other tool is that uh, where with planes, uh, maybe chisels, uh, saws, things like that, uh, the more pricey they get, the slower the quality they gain. Does it make sense? I think... And with files, I feel it's very, very different. If you pay $50 for a file uh, as opposed to $10, you really get five times more of the quality. It really feels like it is substantial. So when it comes to companies and brands, uh, I heard about Nicholson. I don't know if they're any good. I've never used one. Uh, they seem to me that they're in the same kind of level as a uh, third. third. Well, this is an old third and I have the feeling that they were slightly better back in the days than they are today. I think I would call Nicholson and Ferd kind of a mid-tier. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they do amazing files today, but uh, that's at least what I've seen and experienced. Um, a really high quality brand, as far as I can tell, is uh, another German company, which has a slightly unfortunate name. Uh, so I would just call them the short version of Richard. And, uh, it's, and they make really, really excellent files as well as needle files. I know that uh, Swiss companies make good needle files. So you can look into that if you're in uh, the hunt for some high-end quality files. So when it comes to rasps, I can only uh, tell you what I've heard and know because I'm not a heavy rasp user. I'm not a cabinet maker. But as opposed to German and Swiss that make really, really high-end files, with, when it comes to rasps or hand-stitched rasp, uh, I know that the French are really good. Uh, there's a company called uh, Liogier. I don't know if I pronounce it right, but uh, they're a French company and I will link them in the description. And they do hand-stitched rasp. This one right here is not a hand-stitched, uh, but it works fine for me. The idea with hand-stitched is that you don't get a pattern or you don't follow the ridges when you go for a second uh, kind of stroke in the wood because of the random teeth that the file has or the rasp has and that's what makes it so smooth to work with. So if you want really good rasps, go with French, good files, go with German or Swiss. Probably there are really good Japanese files as well, but I'm not too familiar with those. So I would recommend getting a, maybe a chipset in the beginning just to so you have different shapes of files, but I would also recommend investing in one really, really good file just to get a perspective of how it is to work with the high quality files because it really is a different experience. And overall, I think it's also the most cost effective uh, way to purchase. So that's kind of what I have to say about files and uh, let's move on. Okay, so let's dive into uh, talking about gravers. Now, this is a kind of a difficult subject because uh, I'm going to talk mostly about making your own gravers. And this is my most common uh, questions that I get is where do I source the material? Where can I buy ready-made gravers? And uh, I will try to answer the best as I can, but unfortunately I don't have too much information. So I will tell you what I know and maybe you can, uh, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. So let's talk about this chisel right here, the graver, this one. And this is from High Speed Steel. I, I bought the blank from Hong Kong on eBay. And uh, it's, I don't know, the grade of this High Speed Steel. I would assume from the price that it's not very high. But I use these ones, I grind them or sand them. You cannot, I cannot at least heat treat them because I don't know how to heat treat High Speed Steel. So uh, they're pretty good. And I really like this one. However, in the future, I'm not going to purchase this these blanks any longer just because I don't know the quality of this material and uh, I would much prefer and willing to invest a little bit more money 
in some local material and local supply. So the material I purchase at the moment are these uh, low alloy, high carbon steel, and these are really nice uh, pieces of material that I use for many, many tools, as you've seen before, for my planes and for chisels and all that stuff. Uh, and this is from a local blacksmith shop, and I can link to them. I don't know, it's in Germany, so I don't know if they will ship to US or something like that. And I believe you can find locally better ways to get this type of material. This is, I believe, 1095, I don't remember exactly, but it's a low alloy, high carbon steel, and they work really, really well. But they don't hold an edge, obviously, as much as a high speed steel or tungsten carbide and all of that but I like them because I can heat treat them myself and which means that when they are annealed I can work with files and make all sorts of you know weird shapes that will fit my uh, my needs and all of that now these chisels right here I think would in interest some of you I just want to show you that if you cannot source raw stock of uh, high carbon steel high speed steel carbon carbide or whatever uh, you can just buy punches from the local hardware store, you know, anneal them with the torch, uh, shape them, heat treat them again with, some, with like quenching them in water and then tempering, and you can make them chisels and they work really nicely. Again, they're not very high graded steel, so they do need sharpening every once in a while. But uh, if you want a cheap solution and you want to get into engraving, that works really fine too. I don't love those because they're ringing, they're like, I, I can demonstrate. It's not a very pleasant noise, but uh, yeah, that should work. Okay, lastly, I want to show some of my collection of punches and Japanese Tagane chisels. And uh, these are again, just raw stock that I've made, some punches, some, uh, I don't know, like dies and things uh, like, like sorts. And I want to show you these ones. These ones, I think, should be a Tagane, which is carving, I think, in Japanese, uh, engraving chisels. And I was looking for these ones for a very, very long time, and I didn't know where to find them, until I've stumbled upon art supply in the UK online that, weirdly enough, have those, and they market them as punches for embossing or something like that. But they are really, really nice. They cost like $5 a piece, which is, I mean, if you make your own chisels from that, that's on the expensive side. On the other hand, they, are, they seem to be hand forged. So I'm really willing to pay the $5 for some of those because they're really nice. And they, uh, yeah, and the way you work with them is that if there's no handle, you just chisel. Oh, your life away like that backwards and uh, yeah I will link to those as well I don't have an affiliation with them too but uh, yeah if you want to get some Tagane I think that is a good place to go so this is roughly my uh, engraving chisels collection and I apologize if I don't have concrete places that you can go and buy uh, gravers the only thing I can tell you that I know the GRS are very very big in uh, uh, engraving uh, supplies. I never purchased anything from them, so I cannot uh, recommend or tell you if they're, uh, they look like it's high quality, so. So you can do that. But yeah, as a, as a final note, I just want to say that I recommend giving a try at uh, heat treating your own steel and filing and shaping your own uh, chisels because once you learn how to do that, and it's not very difficult. It opens so many doors to tool making. You can just, you know, you need some knife or something, a small scraper, take a piece of steel, file it down. And the more you do it, the easier it gets and the more fun you have with it. So I will, this is my best recommendation I can give is to go ahead and try to make your own chisels. You know, I've decided I left the piece with the gravers a little bit too uh, uninformative. So, I will do a quick chisel, really, really quick, just to show you how simple it is to do. So I have this piece here, it's a 1095, I'm pretty sure it's a 1095. We're just gonna make a quick flat chisel out of it, so it's in the vise.
All right, we have the bell, so we're done. So I'm gonna close the light so I can see the heat. So uh, you can use a magnet in order to check that it reached uh, like 900 degrees Celsius, uh, 1425 degrees Fahrenheit. But I find that uh, there's really no need to. The best way to check if the chisel is uh, right for the quench is when the luminosity, <laughs> I don't know. Basically when the chisel gets hot enough that it loses kind of the shade, the shadow. So it's orangey and you cannot distinguish the edges. Somewhere like that. That's when you quench it. And it should be hardened at this point. Let me turn on the light. And you can hear uh, that it skids off easily. So at this point you take some scotch bright or sandpaper to reveal the metal. So what we want is a nice yellow strawish color. So as you can tell, the, it just got a little bit uh, yellowish towards the tip, which is what we want. The, with the real small gravers, especially with the pointy ones, I would not use a strop because the strop will uh, round over the point, which is kind of beats the purpose. But this is a big enough flat chisel that they can use a strop. Uh, normally, I would use just a small stone for that. Yeah, as you can see, it's a nice, nice chisel for this type of work, but it's a nice chisel. It works really nicely. It's a bit rough. So this is, chisel doesn't really fit for metal work. Uh, for metal, you want kind of bevel uh, on both sides. But as you can see, it can work on metal as well. If you want to scrape. So yeah, that's basically how you can make a chisel, your own tool, customized tool pretty easily in the exact shape you want. It doesn't take too much rocket science to do so. Uh, and it's a perfectly viable tool. All right, let's uh, continue. Now let's talk about woodworking chisels. Now you can probably uh, already tell that I uh, want to be very eclectic with my tools. I have a variety of different looking stuff. Uh, but first I want to talk about just, you know, flat chisels. These, this set of chisels, those flat chisels, cost about maybe, I don't know, like $12, $15 at the most. And there are nothing, there's nothing bad to say about them. They really, they really work incredibly well. And uh, it's a nice steel that they have. It's a chrome vanadium. I don't know what that means, but they hold an edge pretty nicely. And uh, yeah, and they're pretty sharp and it's very, very nice to work with. Now you can probably see that they don't match. That's because I, I finoodled around with them a little bit and colored them, but they, are, they came together, the same set. I will try to look for a link for them online and I hopefully I can find. Uh, again, it's in Europe, so I don't know uh, if you can find the same uh, types of chisels. I know that, I think that Paul Sellers talked about the same set and uh, he showed how well they work as well. Having said that, and as nice as those chisels are, chisels are I am going to invest in the near future in a little bit of a high, higher quality chisels, maybe Japanese chisels, even though they are very expensive. I mean, expensive as in one chisel cost about, I don't know, like 16 of those, <laughs> four times these sets. So, uh, so, I, so we'll see. But the thing is, is that there's something very special with chisels. Uh, and I think more, more than any other tool is that well, at least for me, is that they kind of become your friend, your partner, they get a personality. So yeah, I think uh, because chisels, for me at least, have a really thing with character, uh, I would like to invest in a slightly nicer, just to get a nicer feeling when, when, when I work with them. So moving on to my weird 
weirder chisels. This is kind of a saya chisel, uh, which is meant for, you know, scabbards in Japanese swords and knives and what uh, have you. And this basically was a regular chisel that I've bent and it's okay. It's not amazing. I just wanted to have one. But these ones have a similar goal as in they are bent so you can reach in difficult areas and I've made them myself. Really fun to work with, fantastic chisel. I really recommend making one just for, for fun. Lastly, uh, there is a carving chisels or gouges. I'm not gonna talk a lot about it because I don't have a really wide collection of those. Normally, I would just buy secondhand old ones, used ones, and sometimes they're really good, sometimes they are not. It's kind of a hit and miss. What I would recommend is that there are many of those that you can buy on eBay or Amazon, I think it's like 12, set of 12, these ones uh, for about $20 or something weird like that, like that, or even less. And they are not worth the steel at all. So not recommending, as opposed to the flat chisels, I didn't have a good experience buying cheap carving chisels. So I don't know if they are good ones, maybe they are, but the ones I bought are not good at all but if you got into wood carving and you really really like it and you want to do more uh, I think getting a, a nice set of chisels is the way to go unfortunately they are expensive there is a company called uh, Pfeil I think from Switzerland and uh, there is another company that I forget Chestnut or something from England something with nuts <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, they, uh, they're a little bit expensive, but uh, I think, but uh, you know, maybe you get three in the beginning. But these are tips that I cannot give you because I'm not a very experienced carver. So I don't know too much about it. But uh, yeah, I have some old chisels that are good and um, yeah, I'm happy with that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about hammers. And as you can see, uh, I'm not a blacksmith yet in the terms of collection, but I have a nice variety that I really love using, mostly small small hammers. I love my, my small hammers, they really are a delight and I love working with them. Let's go through them a little bit and I will explain what I like most and what, what I use them for and what is, I think, beneficial as it goes for hammers. Ah, and by the way, just uh, to show weird hammers, I have this one. This one is a uh, shoemaking hammer from a really long time ago. I don't use it for anything, but I love this hammer. It's a very pretty, so I keep it. So you can recognize this hammer that I've made a while ago and um, lots of people really loved it. And I use it quite a bit. I use it mostly for chisel work as a kind of a mallet. Yeah, just like a heavier, yeah, I wouldn't call it a sledgehammer because it really isn't. And as well as the steel is pretty soft. So uh, yeah, I like it. It's, it's fun to work with and it's my pretty hammer, so that's cool. This is my uh, classic cartoon style hammer. Uh, classic and nice. I don't use it that much. It's, I don't see much use for that, to be honest. This one is kind of a chasing hammer, so it's used to flatten or kind of pin things. I use it quite often. It's really nice and handy. Yeah, you, you know what these hammers do. Let's go for the small hammers and the more important ones. All right, so these are my collection of small, let's say, jewelers, chasing, engraving hammers and all of that. This is probably the hammer that sees most uh, use. I bought the head and it's specially for engraving, I guess. I made the handle because the handle that comes with it normally is something that looks more like this handle. If you're asking why this handle looks so weird, it's because um, the handle really needs to flex. So that's why it's so thin and you have this bolster in the, in the bottom because that's where you hold it most of the time. And uh, I believe that man manufacturers don't make the handle this way because they are afraid, and rightfully so, that in the shipping or whatever handling, the handle would break and they will get a lot of bad reviews. But I recommend that if you want to get into engraving, hammer and chisel engraving, make your own handle or take the existing one and make it thinner because it really makes a difference when working. It makes the rhythm 
all nice and, and punchy. And yeah, there is a risk that the handle will break, but that's part of the, part of the fun, I suppose. Uh, but manufacturers, I haven't seen them make the handle that thin. I think just because they're afraid they're going to get bad reviews for when it breaks. Next is just a little uh, aluminium hammer, aluminum hammer. Uh, that's all right, just a soft aluminum hammer. So this one, I looked a really long time to find this hammer. And weirdly enough, this cost 30 euros or 35 dollars to purchase this tiny, tiny hammer. But I really wanted one, so I was willing to pay the price. Uh, why is it so expensive? I don't know. Maybe because it's uh, not very common or something like that. But this is a Japanese chasing hammer. So what does it mean? You take your chisel and chasing and you chase away. And I don't know. I really love this hammer. This is a similar one. It's a little bit bigger, but it's still very, very tiny. And I believe this is for woodworking. So uh, kind of chisel work, but much, much finer, a little bit so, uh, like, you know, much softer blows, more for precision. This is a hammer I've made. I really wanted another chasing hammer and uh, it looks really nice and it looks kind of similar, but uh, I don't have access to blacksmithing shop, at least not yet. I didn't try. So this one is made out of brass and I colored it. So I know it's uh, sacrilegious a little bit. And this was in one of my videos, the whale hammer. And this one is just a weird one to tap kind of the plain wedge out. Uh, I don't use it that much, but it's a weird one. The only thing is if you want to get into engraving, the, buy the right weighted chasing hammer, Japanese, Western, whatever you want, but it needs to be uh, the right weight because if you buy this chasing hammer, uh, you will have a, a weird time and you won't practice the engraving correctly and you will get weird muscle memory and it's not going to work very nicely for you. It will be way too aggressive. So let's talk about how I finish wood. Sounds a bit weird, but it's true. Um, I don't have much experience with lots of finishes, but I can tell you what I use and what I like to use. Uh, let's go through it. This is some uh, pigment. This you can mix in with linseed oil and it gives a, you can make really nice stains out of it. Uh, they can be a little bit more splotchy, but they're literally exactly the same as any other stain that I know. Uh, for instance, this one is water-based and it's literally a pigment with water as far as I can tell. So you can just buy a, literally every pigment you want, mix it with some linseed oil, mix it with water or whatever, and it should work as a nice stain. You can get every color that you want. As it comes to wax, I have uh, just beeswax. Uh, so this is like commercial beeswax. It's already nice and smooth and squishy. Uh, or you can make your own, which is, this is pretty old, but uh, it basically it's beeswax, linseed oil, and some turpentine divided by three. And then you need to heat it up in a kind of a bain marie, you know, hot water and then another vessel inside with all the uh, schmaltz there. And that uh, should get it nice and soft, let it rest, and then you get a nice paste. So beeswax is nice, but it's a very kind of a satin finish. So I use it mostly for tools I own or after I put some shellac or shellac. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's it just to maintain everything is is wax. It's not, uh, it's, yeah, you know, you, you know what wax does. So let's talk about shellac. Shellac, I have this one, which is pre-mixed. It's supposedly professional shellac, I don't know. And this is ruby. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. A shellac dries really, really quickly. It's alcohol based, so it's evaporates. Uh, really fast. Now it, shellac can be tricky and it can be easy. Uh, you, there are two approaches. Either you make French polish, which you rub shellac for hours until you get very smooth rubbing mirror-like finish, which is very difficult to get. Or you just slab it all over the piece and then sand it down, slab some more, and then wire brush it down. And then in the end, you can put some wax. I'm not exactly giving a tutorial here or anything like that. But you catch my drift. Shellac is really nice, dries really quickly, but it can also get a little bit messy. 
Uh, this one right here is kind of a mixture because this is too concentrated. So I at least dilute it down twice as much, you know, to get a nice consistency. I also, I would recommend also buying flakes, not just the pre-mixed one. I calculated the price. They're kind of the same with the pre-mixed, at least this company doesn't really sell it much more expensive, mixed or pre-mixed or whatever. This is what I use, shellac. Okay, lastly, I want to show you a bit of kind of miscellaneous measuring knives, tools and all of that. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, here are some uh, cool kind of vices and uh, this is an old uh, wrench that I found locally and it's really nice and uh, uh, you can probably associate this one with the hand tool rescue. Uh, these are really, really nice, uh, really, really nice wrenches and they're pretty cool. Uh, this one is uh, just like a hand vise that I like. It's old and black. <laughs> uh, this, as many of you will know, is very, very handy to have if you're a woodworker, even though it's called an engineering square or something like that. Very, very handy. Uh, you use it all the time. And recently I also made a really tiny square, which I love because sometimes you want to square, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but you want to square this size of stock and you definitely can do that with this square But it's much nicer to have a tiny one. So I love this one really nice These are cheap calipers and that's very important for me that this is cheap because I'm uh, not a machinist and I don't work with uh, thousands of an inch so to have a uh, cheap calipers that I can scribe with on brass is very handy for me and uh, I've been using this one for about a year now I think and I use it all the time and it's still really sharp so I'm happy with this one about $15 or something like that and uh, yeah still good tiny brass calipers these ones you cannot scribe with obviously I can I, I kind of never use these calipers but I saw them and I bought them for like one euro and they're really really nice ones so now as it goes with knives I'm not as you can tell really a knife guy I don't have many knives I have some more than this ones and this one I, I bought a long time ago I made the handle but the blade itself is from I think Nord Steel something like that and these are really cheap blades but they seem to be really really high quality uh, so I like this never use it because I don't know what to use it for but I thought it was cool uh, this is a knife that I've used for a very, very long time. It's from, it's pretty dirty, but it's from Kirschen. Uh, they make pretty good chisels. And I bought this carving knife, which, to be honest, not super happy. Uh, it is a good knife, but it somehow feels like the steel is not that great. So, uh, but it, they do work. I mean, it does work as a knife, I suppose. And this one is kind of a kiridashi type knife that I use for, uh, like as a marking knife. Uh, I've made this not long ago and uh, it's from O1 Steel. And yeah, it's a nice knife. It's cool, nice, simple. I like it very much. So my friends, that's it for this video. I think we've talked about plenty of things and I really hope that maybe you took something from this video, maybe something you didn't know, maybe something you did know. I don't know. <laughs> Anywho, I would just want to say again, thank you very much for coming here. 100,000 subscribers is uh, still incomprehensible for me in a way. And uh, I'm uh, really grateful and, uh, and I'm super happy that this is what I do uh, almost every day and every week. And uh, it's incredible and I love it. And I hope I will do it for many, many more years. Uh, so thank you and I also want to give a huge thanks to my patrons over at Patreon for helping me upgrade the shop a little bit, get a new table, new woodworking vice. This is incredible, so thank you as well. And so yeah, next video we'll do something a bit more projecty project, uh, back into our regular scheduled video. And so yeah, I will see you then and uh, have fun. And I will see you then.